Good afternoon, everybody. This is uh, Nicolas Zabaras. Uh, this is continuation of our lectures on uh, statistical computing and machine learning. So today we're going to uh, hear a little bit about uh, information theory. And uh, in some sense, you may think that um, information theory is not uh, directly linked to machine learning, but uh, you will see much of the terminology and concepts to be introduced today will be things that we will see uh, being used in many algorithms in uh, machine learning. All right, so let's see uh, a little bit on um, the contents of the lecture today. So we're going to introduce uh, what entropy means. And uh, if you remember when we discussed about different probability densities, I gave you some formulas for the entropy and I told you to wait until later on. So we will see what entropy means. Uh, we will uh, formally introduce the KL a divergence measure to uh, uh, sort of uh, count for the distance between two uh, distributions. Uh, in the process, we are going to see the Jensen's inequality that is being used uh, in the KL divergence uh, for the proof, but uh, is way much more powerful, appearing in uh, many applications in uh, machine learning, in uh, uh, variational uh, methods and elsewhere. So Jensen's inequality will be very fundamental uh, in calculations in machine learning. Uh, we will uh, talk about mutual information. And uh, if you remember somewhere in uh, passing, I had mentioned that mutual information will be a very useful measure uh, for uh, you know, deciding the independence uh, between random variables. Uh, we talked that uh, correlation is only a good measure for uh, linear relations, so we will see that mutual information can be extended uh, much uh, further. Uh, we will introduce this uh, maximal information coefficient, which is a more recent concept, uh, briefly at least. So uh, the goals for the lectures today are to understand the terminology and the fundamental concepts from uh, information theory, uh, familiarize ourselves with things such as entropy, uh, mutual information, um, KL divergence, uh, maximum information coefficient, um, acquire uh, a working knowledge of Jensen's inequality, in particularly when you use it with a log function, and we will see this um, in uh, some examples uh, today. And uh, once we discuss about the Jensen's inequality, we will also uh, bring up uh, the definition and properties of the KL divergence, and that will be covering a lot of the material for today's lecture. So uh, the material is going to be um, more theoretical than uh, normal, uh, and the only thing that I really I would like you to keep from the lecture today is some of the fundamental definitions and, and uh, at least some practical meaning for the different terms uh, we're going to use um, in, uh, in this lecture. Okay, so uh, let's uh, uh, move on to define uh, the, uh, what uh, entropy is going to be about. So let me, by the way, before I start, uh, uh, give you a few uh, fundamental references, uh, both the uh, textbook by Chris Bishop and uh, Kevin Murphy, they discuss about um, in uh, a few pages uh, about information theory. Uh, there is more discussion in uh, Jane's book, but actually the key uh, reference for many of the things uh, today are the excellent textbook by uh, Professor Mackay, uh, Information Theory, Inference and Learning Algorithms. And uh, also uh, in his website, he has a series of video lectures on information theory that I would strongly encourage you at some point in your PhD studies to actually look over. Uh, Professor Mackay passed away a few years ago, but I think his legacy and his contribution in integrating information theory and machine learning is going to be there for uh, uh, many, many years to come. So uh, what is information theory? So information theory uh, basically has um, two tasks. Uh, one is to provide uh, a compact representation of data, and this is what we call uh, source coding. And the other one is uh, transmitting the data in a way that is robust to errors. And this is what's called uh, a channel coding. 
Now I'm going to use in uh, uh, the lecture today uh, the word uh, code word and usually when I refer to code work uh, I effectively mean a sequence of bids like for example you know one one zero one zero one or something like that that represents uh, a coded symbol uh, or a string so this is what I mean uh, a code word so to uh, compactly represent uh, basically uh, uh, you know, coded symbols uh, or strings, uh, the way we have to do it is if something is of very high probability, uh, we have to assign a very short code word. And if it is something of uh, low probability, then we have to assign uh, a long code word. Now, you may wonder uh, uh, how is this, um, um, you know, resonates with uh, practical things that you may already know. And I remind you in, in natural language processing, for example, the most common words like A, V, and, etc. have uh, uh, very short uh, code words, but, you know, and they are very short, you can see them, all right? Uh, but uh, words that uh, are very rare, they are much longer than that, okay? So we will follow the same thing here. A compact representation of data will account from the probability of this data. So if the probability of uh, seeing uh, a realization, let's say a random variable is very high, um, so if, for example, if that uh, uh, you know variable is deterministic, then we will assign a very small, very short code word uh, if the probability is uh, very low, so we don't see often uh, that um, uh, coded symbol, then we will assign uh, a code word that uh, is uh, much longer. Okay, and I will give you an example in, uh, uh, I believe, in a few slides uh, on this, so this will make a little bit more sense when we reach that point. Okay, so... Um, in uh, being able to, uh, you know, decode messages that we send over channels, we need to know, uh, we need to have a good probability model for what type of uh, uh, data and messages we anticipate uh, to see coming uh, to the channel. Um, and so we need to know the probability of these messages that people send to the channel. And, um, um, uh, and so uh, we will see this coming up in... Um, in our calculations that will be very elementary. So let me start with some, uh, let's say that we're sending to a channel some discrete uh, random variable uh, X. And the question that uh, we want to ask is, when we learn the realization of some random variable X, uh, how much information did that bring in? Uh, what was the degree of surprise uh, learning this little X, okay? And um, uh, obviously, as I mentioned before, uh, if uh, we have an event that is highly probable, then we are learning very little, right? But if it is something less probable, we are le learning a lot. So, um, so that's one thing that somehow um, uh, we want to account uh, when uh, we bring sort of a measure for the type of information, the amount of information we learn when uh, uh, a realization of new random variable is coming in the picture, okay? Now, something else that uh, we may want to account has to do with um, uh, events that they are uh, independent. And you remember if, um, uh, you know, we already define in probability what it means for X and Y to be uh, independent, and also we introduce the concept of uh, events being uncorrelated. So if we have... Um, uh, you know, two events that they are not related to each other, and we will see what that may mean. So effectively, the information that we will learn by observing both little x and hy, we anticipate to be the sum of the information or the degree of surprise we learned by observing or, uh, you know, receiving little x, and the amount of information we uh, observe by receiving uh, little y. So, um, so we need to introduce uh, a measure of uh, information that somehow accounts for these um, uh, two um, fundamental entities that I discussed. One, for example, that uh, 
you know, if something is very probable, uh, we need to assign, uh, you know, some uh, very small uh, measure of uh, the information acquired by observing it. And then we need to account for the fact that uh, if you observe X and Y, uh, that they are unrelated, then the information gain uh, sort of uh, makes sense to be the sum of the H of X uh, and um, uh, H of Y. All right, so, um, so what we're going to do is um, uh, we're, you know, we're going to obviously uh, try to relate this um, uh, information that I introduced regarding the information learned or the degree of surprise with what we know about probabilities. And you remember for uh, two um, independent uh, uh, events, X and Y, or two independent variables, the joint distribution factorizes as such. And uh, so this maybe can relate very nicely with this uh, second statement uh, about information gained from two unrelated events. But also this can be related with the fact that we want to assign to highly probable events uh, uh, a very small measure of age of the uh, information uh, acquired by observing X. So what will be a good uh, measure of um, uh, age based on this? And uh, so the measure would be uh, minus the log of the probability P of X. So observing the realization X of the random variable, uh, the degree of surprise, uh, the uh, knowledge, uh, the information gained, uh, we represent it as minus log of uh, P of X, where P of X is the probability of X. and, and um, uh, we use uh, in the log a scale 2 so that the units that are coming out of this H of X are in what is called bits. All right. So the units uh, that we use for uh, what uh, I can now call uh, entropy is uh, in, uh, in uh, units of uh, bits. All right. Now you remember that uh, X is a random variable and what we're really interested is not just the information that we gain if we observe uh, X, but we're more interested in um, the uh, information uh, that uh, we obtain in average. So effectively what uh, we want to compute is we want to compute an average of uh, little h of X, which I call here uh, capital H of X, and uh, this is literally what uh, we define as being the entropy of the random variable X. So this is the information gained in average, all right, when we transmit this random variable X. So in average, this is the information uh, that we gain. Now, again, you can uh, uh, look on this uh, definition for little uh, H of X, and you can see uh, that uh, uh, all of the things that I mentioned before are taken care of. So, for example, I mentioned if we have uh, two independent events, you expect H of X and Y to be H of X plus H of Y. So the, the independence of X and Y in uh, probability uh, immediately implies that relation. And also we can see from this definition that if we're sending... Uh, 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 if we have um, uh, a random variable or, uh, or an event that has a very low probability, uh, then H of X will provide a very high information content. So rare uh, or events, rare observations basically lead to high information content and thus to uh, high entropy. Okay, let me uh, give you a, a practical example for all of these things to make a little bit uh, of sense. Uh, so I'm going to take example one first, and uh, I'm going to take a discrete uh, uniform random variable that takes eight possible states. So the probability of every realization of this random variable is one eighth. Uh, so uh, in my definition on uh, the entropy of X, I have um, uh, eight states, each of them with probability one over eight. So when you do this calculation, it turns out that for this discrete uniform random variable, uh, the uh, entropy is three bits. Okay? Uh, very easy. Now, let me uh, take a little bit uh, a more complex example. We're going to take uh, a discrete random variable that has eight possible states that I call here A, B, C, 
the FGH, and we assign to each of them different probabilities, as you can see. All right? Now, uh, can uh, you see before I do any calculation that uh, the entropy in this case uh, is going to be smaller than that for the uniform distribution? All right, so you can see that I don't, you know, uh, here uh, the uniform distribution is uninformative, right? So everything, every event comes with low probability, which is 1 over 8. But uh, in uh, this second example, some of the realizations of the random variable come with higher probability than others. So you anticipate uh, that the entropy uh, is going to be uh, less than that uh, for the uniform distribution. As a matter of fact, um, we will see, um, you know, we will see a few slides from now uh, that uh, the uniform uh, distribution in the context of discrete random variables has actually uh, the, the maximum entropy, okay? And we will prove it. So let me um, do a calculation for uh, this uh, particular uh, uh, random variable. So I have uh, x, little x taking any of these um, uh, states and the corresponding p of x is, that I gave you is given like that. And uh, I am taking uh, the code to represent each of the states the way that you see it here. And you can immediately see that uh, something that is uh, very rare, like, you know, I am I'm observing age with um, uh, probability 1 over 64, so it's a very rare event. You can see the code is longer, but something that has higher probability has a smaller code. In this case, I only need one digit, or in the case of B that comes with probability 1 fourth, I need two digits, uh, and uh, uh, etc. So, uh, higher uh, probability uh, words come with uh, lower codes, okay, and uh, and uh, smaller probability uh, rare uh, words come with uh, a much uh, uh, longer length of these uh, code words. So let's calculate the um, the entropy. All right, so I'm just using the definition. And uh, so you plug in everything that you have. So, for example, uh, if I look at these states uh, EFGH, they all come with probability 164. So I have four of them with probability 164. And similarly, for everything else, you put all of this together and you get uh, uh, two bits. Now, uh, since I have the length uh, and the uh, actual code words that I use for these uh, states, a, B, C, D to H. So let me uh, calculate also uh, the average uh, length uh, of these um, uh, uh, code words. And uh, so, you know, in um, uh, for A, uh, that comes with probability 1 over 2, the length is 1. For B, the length is 2 with probability 1 over 4, etc. And this comes to be equal to uh, 2 bits. And this will allow me, without uh, much uh, elaboration, because it will take us to another subject, uh, to state uh, Shannon's uh, noiseless uh, coding theorem back from uh, 1948, that the entropy is a lower bound on the number of bits that uh, we need to transmit the, sa the state of a random variable. So think of the entropy as the smaller number of bits that we need, on average, to represent a symbol. Okay, so it's the smaller number again of bits needed in average to represent uh, a symbol. Uh, and uh, as we see here with this proof, uh, basically the average uh, of uh, the symbol code lengths, uh, this is what we computed. Okay, so the uh, uh, entropy is a lower bound to the number of bits that we need to transmit uh, the uh, state of this random variable. Okay, um, all right, so uh, let me, you know, uh, entropy is not uh, a word that people use only in, um, uh, you know, in machine learning and information theory. Lots of people in uh, statistical mechanics uh, and thermodynamics, uh, they are using uh, entropy uh, as well, okay? So uh, I'm not going to go to that subject because it's going to take us completely out of uh, the focus of this lecture. But let me uh, 
just briefly in one slide uh, give you this uh, definition. So let's say we have n identical objects. So think of this as being, um, you know, uh, n balls uh, that we're going to place them in uh, different bins. And in each, uh, in the bin one, we're going to have n1 uh, balls in bin two, n2, etc. So you may remember from the um, uh, normalization of the uh, multinomial uh, distribution, the different ways that can I can arrange these n balls inside these um, uh, bins is given by this ratio, n factorial divided by n1 factorial times n2 factorial, uh, etc., depending on how many bins um, I have. All right? So, um, Think uh, for now, all right, so this is the multiplicities, how many different uh, ways I can arrange these balls in the bins, but also think the particular way that I can order these balls in every bin uh, are what I call microstates. I mean, in this particular case, obviously I have identical objects, right? But, you know, if you are putting those um, balls, let's say on bin one in some order, uh, the number of different ways to um, uh, to uh, order them is n1 factorial in the first bin and 2 factorial in the second bin, etc. This is what people in statistical mechanics call uh, microstates. Okay, so again, this ratio w uh, gives you the multiplicity, the total number of different uh, ways that you can arrange the n balls to these bins. Uh, where the number of balls in each i bin is ni. Obviously, the summation of ni is equal to capital uh, N in this case. All right, uh, so the way we can define uh, the entropies uh, using this multiplicity uh, as follows. Uh, log of w divided by n. So if I take the logs of w, I get this nice expression. And I'm going to try to simplify it to show you that somehow I can get a similar expression to the generic definition we introduced from uh, an information theoretic point of view. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use uh, Sterling's formula. And uh, uh, possibly a lot of you have not seen it because you know this comes again in thermodynamics and statistical mechanics. So let me just uh, uh, give you what Sterling's formula is. If n goes to infinity, uh, the log of n factorial approximately is n times log of n minus n. I'm going to assume also that these ni's are big, so log of ni factorial uh, is ni log of ni minus ni. So if you take these two approximations, when uh, n and ni are basically big numbers, you plug them in in uh, this definition of entropy. And uh, I believe the only uh, else that you need to do is you also need to use in uh, the simplification to derive the formula I'm going to give you. You have to use that the sum of ni is equal to capital N. And when you do all of the above, you basically get uh, the, form the following wonderful uh, result that h is uh, minus the summation of ni over n uh, log of ni over n. And you remember from uh, the multinomial distribution, what is uh, ni uh, over n, right, is the probability that a ball uh, will actually be placed on the i-th bin, okay? And that's what I call pi here. And I call uh, this arrangement of these n balls to the different bins as being the macrostates. So think of this pi uh, representing uh, the uh, probabilities for the macrostates, okay? I remind you, microstates was the different ways of arranging the balls in each bin, and uh, these macrostates is the different ways of arranging the end balls, uh, uh, the different ways of placing them in the uh, whatever number of bins uh, we have uh, in our situation. But anyways, you can see at the bottom from the equation that this is uh, precisely the same definition that uh, we had before. So the entropy is minus p i log of p i summation for all possible values of p i's, and these p i's are um, the probabilities for uh, these uh, uh, macrostates. Okay, so effectively we got from a completely different direction, we got the same uh, answer, which is uh, nice. 
Okay, so let me, uh, I'm gonna give you uh, two uh, uh, examples of computing the entropy. And uh, so here is, uh, uh, let me see on the left, we have, um, you know, this is a histogram of some distribution and I compute uh, the entropy, it comes to be 177. And uh, that's a, a small number. And uh, based on everything we have said, you should not be surprised that this distribution has a small number because you notice it is, uh, it's very narrow and it and it's, uh, has a big peak, right? So uh, uh, if we make this peak to uh, be almost zero, then we're gonna get an entropy that is zero, right? Because this uh, event here is gonna become, um, you know, is gonna become deterministic. Now, if we take a distribution that is uh, more spread around, uh, you can see that the entropy increases, right? So we're going to an entropy that is uh, uh, 309. Okay, um, let me, uh, you know, uh, prove something that I stated uh, with the words uh, in passing. So we looked before, if you remember, for um, uh, discrete distributions, and I think I had one of the examples that it was the uh, uniform distribution, and um, and I told you that the uniform distribution is going to come up. It came in the example, but in general, it is actually for a discrete set of distributions that have the same number of uh, states. Uh, the uniform distribution is the one that has uh, the maximum entropy. Okay, and. Um, you can actually prove it very nicely, and I'm not going to do all the algebra, but I'm going to highlight what the proof is going to look like. All right. So if you look, if you take the um, the definition of the entropy for a discrete distribution, okay, we're going to try to maximize this. Uh, we just have to be a little bit careful uh, when you maximize uh, this with respect to p of x i, the probability of its state of this distribution, what actually we need to account for the fact is uh, that this distribution is normalized. So we are going to maximize not just the entropy, but this augmented uh, objective that with a Lagrange multiplier that includes this normalization constraint. So again, uh, I have this objective for uh, a discrete distribution with a fixed number uh, of states and we're going to try to prove that the uniform distribution is the one that maximizes this. So what you need to do is you need to take uh, derivatives with respect to p of xi, and when you do that, uh, if we assume that uh, we have uh, m possible states, it comes out immediately, right, that p of xi is equal to 1 over m. Try it, all right, go home and uh, take derivatives with respect to p of xi, and you'll see that the answer is 1 over m, uh, and not only that, you can actually see that this uh, function here has a maximum, all right, by computing the second derivative that comes to be negative, so you can check that um, uh, as well. So the maximum distribution, uh, discrete distribution for uh, M states, it turns out to be uh, the uniform distribution uh, P of xi equal 1 over m for every xi from i equal 1 to m. There is another way to prove this um, uh, without uh, uh, doing this, um, um, you know, uh, this type of calculation, and that requires a little bit uh, of something that we will uh, uh, see uh, later on. So actually, let me just highlight it, and maybe once you hear the whole lecture, you can come back to the slide to make a sense. So for any uh, discrete, uh, uh, for any discrete um, uh, random variable x uh, with m states, its entropy is less than the entropy of the uniform random variable with m states. And uh, here is this alternative uh, proof. If you start with the entropy of your discrete random variable, okay, you can write this minus log of p like that. And uh, here, I'm using what's called the Jensen's inequality, where this um, uh, expectation basically of this log, right, with the respect to this p of x i distribution is less than the log of the expectation, right, I can move the log basically outside, less than the log 
of the expectation of 1 over pxi. So this and this cancel out and you get an m here and that's uh, log of m which is the entropy uh, of the uniform distribution. Again, what I'm using here is um, Jensen's inequality for the log function that is concave and uh, I give you the formula for the Jensen's inequality on the bottom. Uh, so actually that's the only thing you need to use uh, this alternative proof, but I'm not going to say much uh, more about the Jensen's inequality because we will cover it in a, a few slides in more detail because it's very fundamental uh, to machine learning. Okay, um, so let me, uh, uh, since we talked about uh, uh, the entropy for discrete distributions, I am going to uh, remind you this uh, uh, biosequence analysis plots, these motif plots as we call them, where if you remember at different locations in the genome, we plot uh, uh, the uh, chemical elements that are dominating based on um, uh, maximum likelihood uh, type of estimation. And uh, I remind you we had uh, uh, four letters to define these um, um, uh, uh, chemical elements of the DNA. Those were the letters A, C, D, and G. And uh, when we did this type of uh, plot, I only told you that uh, uh, the higher the MLE estimate for a particular uh, letter, uh, the bigger uh, the, uh, the size of the plot of that letter in this, um, in, this, uh, in this plot. So I can actually tell you now and be a little bit more specific and tell you that the height of uh, each bar it's actually defined as 2 minus h uh, where h is the entropy of that distribution. So um, the uh, maximum entropy, all right, so you can think here uh, if I take, let's say, this case where I only have uh, a letter G, right? So in this case, basically, there's no randomness, it's all deterministic. Uh, uh, so in this case, uh, the entropy is uh, zero, and you can see the maximum size of this bar is actually equal to two. Okay? So uh, when... Uh, uh, the problem, you know, when the location gives me only one of the letters, the entropy is uh, zero and the size of the letter is equal to two. And of course, uh, if I have a uniform distribution, there are four letters, uh, so you can calculate the, uh, the uh, entropy for a uniform distribution with four states, which is given uh, here. And then you can see actually that, uh, uh, you know, the bar, uh, in that, for the uniform distribution, um, you know, uh, will correspond to size uh, zero because uh, uh, the entropy is going to be two, so two minus two uh, is going to be zero. So again, uh, this is how uh, the specifics of uh, how the size of these letters uh, was done. Uh, we used two minus h or H was uh, the entropy of the underlying discrete uh, probability distribution, the multi-annual distribution with uh, uh, four states. Okay, uh, so let me uh, keep continuing here, um, do a few more uh, elementary examples. So if we have uh, a binary uh, Bernoulli distribution, so heads, tails basically, uh, the variable takes the values x equal to 1 or x equal to 0 with probability theta. Uh, if you use the definition of the entropy, uh, you actually get this very famous result. Uh, extremely important in uh, um, many areas in machine learning. Uh, in deep learning, is being used as a loss function. So it comes everywhere for discrete ra random variables. So that's the entropy for uh, a Bernoulli random variable. And you can see from um, uh, this particular plot, uh, if uh, uh, theta is equal to 0.5, all right, uh, that's when the entropy is maximum. If theta is equal to 0 or 1, uh, the uh, entropy uh, is equal to 0. So when the distribution is uh, uniform, as we expect, right, that's when, um, so I can, when I can get heads or tails with the same probability, that's when the entropy of this distribution uh, is the maximum. 
All right, so rather than uh, doing uh, more examples, let me just uh, uh, proceed and uh, extend these ideas that we have seen to differential entropy. So up to now, all the formulas, you notice, uh, they involve summations over the states of discrete variables. You can actually extend this uh, to continuous variables using the definition for uh, discrete uh, uh, random variables. So if P of X is continuous, uh, what you can do is you can uh, binarize, if you like, uh, uh, X uh, with bins of width uh, delta and introduce P, I, P of Xi uh, times delta to be the probability on falling on this bin of size delta. So in principle, uh, you can use the definition uh, of um, uh, the discrete random variable where the probability here is counted as the probability on falling within its different bin, which is P of Xi times delta. So when you use the entropy uh, for this uh, discrete now a representation of the continuous random variable, you get a formula that looks like that. Um, you forget about log of delta as delta goes to uh, zero because that uh, uh, delta, log of delta uh, goes to um, uh, you know, infinity. It basically reminds you that um, you need an infinite number of bits to describe a continuous uh, uh, random variable, so we're not going to account for that. And uh, uh, here, uh, this P of Xi delta log of P Xi as delta goes to zero, uh, and become sort of dx, if you like, can be written down uh, as an integral. And this is the formula that you get for what we call um, uh, a differential entropy. Okay, So we can uh, extend the ideas of um, uh, discrete uh, entropy to uh, entropy of continuous random variable, and this is our uh, nice formula. Um, now, the only thing, uh, uh, and maybe it will surprise you when you do calculations, uh, even for the Gaussian, um, unlike the discrete case, this uh, entropy for continuous random variables can actually be negative. So when you see that, uh, uh, don't get uh, in panic, uh, uh, this can happen. And uh, if you want to do a little calculation of uh, how entropies of um, random variables that relate through some transformation uh, changes. Uh, here is a simple case when uh, y is linear, um, has a linear dependence with x through that uh, uh, matrix, let's say A, so y and x here are vectors. And uh, this is the law uh, for change of probabilities from x to y. Okay, You can actually show, and I'm not going to uh, go through all the algebra, um, is this equation that you see. You can uh, immediately see that the entropy of y is uh, the entropy of um, uh, x plus uh, the log of the determinant uh, of uh, this matrix A. And I remind you when you use um, uh, change um, uh, of variables, right, uh, you're going to, so P of x is going to be P of y times uh, the absolute value of the determinant uh, of A that I indicate here. Okay. Let me uh, uh, highlight uh, an extremely uh, important uh, problem. Uh, so if you take uh, all possible continuous uh, random variables that have the same mean and the same variance, uh, the one that has the maximum entropy, it turns out to be the Gaussian. This is extremely important. So the Gaussian really is, is a maximum uh, entropy um, uh, distribution. So uh, the way you're going to prove this, and again, I am not going to go through the algebra, I'm going to highlight this, is you're going to take the entropy that you see here, and you're going to try to maximize it, all right? But since we said that we need to only maximize it in the family of distributions that have the same mean and the same variance, we're going to use Lagrange multipliers to enforce those constraints. And then, of course, I'm going to have a Lagrange multiplier like we did with the discrete variable before uh, to enforce uh, normalization. Now, um, here you have to um, maximize this with respect to P of X. And, um, um, you know, 
This is not very much different from maximizing a functional with respect to a function. So in principle, you have to use a little bit ideas from calculus of variation. Um, if I can say this with words, what you need to do is uh, take a perturbation of p of x to p plus delta p of x, okay? Uh, write the entropy for that um, uh, uh, perturbed uh, p plus delta p, and then subtract it from the equation that you see written here, and uh, take that first variation of the entropy uh, and set it equal to zero. Effectively, take all the terms that are going to multiply that perturbation delta p uh, to be equal to zero. So actually, when you do that, when you take the first variation of uh, this um, uh, enhanced uh, entropy uh, functional, if you like, you are getting uh, a delta H that looks like this, where delta P is this perturbation on the density P of X. And if you put all the terms together uh, for delta P, um, uh, and please do so because it doesn't involve very much algebra. If you put all the terms in delta P together, they multiply uh, uh, this, you know, in log uh, terms, right? They multiply, you can see here you have delta P uh, times log of P, right? And then here you have delta P times minus 1, and here delta P times lambda 1. So if you put all of this equal to 0, you get this nice P of X that looks in this form, okay? And um, the only thing you need to do now, because we have not optimized this enhanced functional uh, with respect to lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3, so you need to enforce these three constraints. And when you do th that, you will immediately evaluate what lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3 are going to be. And when you normalize that uh, uh, P of X that comes out of it, you do get the Gaussian. Okay? So the Gaussian is... The, uh, from all the distributions that have the same mean and the same variance, the Gaussian is the one that maximizes entropy. That's again uh, uh, an, an amazing result, okay? And literally, I think what I describe is what you need to do the derivation. There is no much more than that. You should uh, uh, take the first variation, set it equal to zero. And I believe, you know, to compute this first variation, uh, you may have to, um, uh, because uh, you have a log of uh, p plus delta p, you may have to um, use uh, some um, approximation formulas. Uh, and I can only guess that uh, maybe, you know, um, the log of p plus delta p, you can write it as uh, the log of p plus um, the log of 1 plus delta p over p and log of uh, 1 plus something small uh, is equal to that something small, right? So that way you get uh, the linear parts in delta p. So you may have to do, I think, one approximation like that, but you will see it immediately that you get this variation, uh, set it equal to zero, get this form, uh, enforce the constraints, and there is uh, the Gaussian. So if you want me, I'll give you the formulas for the entropy of the Gaussian because they need to be handy to use in the calculations. So for the simple univariate case, the answer is what you see here. And um, I mentioned before, the entropy can come to be negative. And indeed, if the variance is less than 1 over 2pe, uh, e, uh, the entropy of the Gaussian is negative. Uh, I also give you the formula for a d-dimensional multivariate Gaussian. So this is the determinant of the covariance. A d, uh, d is the dimensionality of this multivariate Gaussian. Okay? So in uh, the 1D case, d equal to 1. So I put the two formulas together just to save me space. Uh, but this is the formula for the univariate case. And this is the formula for the entropy of the uh, uh, multivariate case. Okay. All right, we already have been a long way with a lot of uh, new concepts. We have seen that uh, the, from the uniform distributions of a uh, certain number of states, the uniform has the uh, maximum uh, entropy. And now we have seen that um, for all the continuous uh, 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 distributions that have the same mean, the same variance, the one that has the, uh, uh, the maximum entropy, it turns out to be 
uh, the Gaussian uh, the Gaussian distribution. All right. So let me introduce uh, another concept. Okay. So um, so um, this is very practical actually, and is going to be fundamental to practically everything in uh, machine learning. Certainly, all variational approximations. So in variational approximations, you know, we have some unknown distribution that I denote here as p of x, and we try to approximate it with some uh, distribution q of x. And usually q of x is a tractable distribution. You can think of it as a Gaussian. So you try to approximate some complex unknown distribution. Maybe you know this distribution through a computer code or maybe through samples, but you try to approximate it with some uh, easy distribution to work with, uh, like um, uh, a Gaussian. And uh, so you need to define a measure of what does it mean approximating P with Q of X. And a good measure that is being used, and there are many that we will not cover in this lecture, a good uh, measure that I introduced briefly in an earlier lecture is the kullback uh, leibler uh, divergence um, uh, KL uh, in brief, and it's defined by this uh, nice formula. If I can go directly on the right-hand side, because most probably this is what you need to remember, the distance between P and Q, and it's denoted like that, is uh, minus uh, p of x of the log of q of p. In uh, many research papers, you will see this also as the expectation with respect to the p distribution of the log of q and p. Remember, there's a minus sign. So if these p's are going to match like that, okay, you're going to have to put a minus sign there. And if you expand the two terms of the log, you actually what you get is this is the entropy of the random variable x. All right, and this uh, looks like an entropy, but it's not quite an entropy. This is what we call a cross entropy. Okay, so here you notice that uh, we're transmitting a distribution q of x um, uh, to an information channel, but the averaging is happening with respect to the distribution p of x. So in principle, it's like using q of x to define our uh, code book. Um, uh, with a source uh, coming from a distribution uh, P of X. Okay, so that's sort of the information, um, um, you know, the information uh, theoretic uh, definition of the KL distance. Um, I'm going to emphasize a few properties in uh, follow up slides, but let me just say uh, this distance is. I mean, if it's a distance, it has to be greater than or equal to zero. Equal to zero when P and Q are the same. So we will actually prove this. Um, we will also see that this distance is not symmetric. So if you take the distance of Q and from P, you actually get a different answer. Um, this can be uh, an issue in uh, some algorithms. In other algorithms, you actually try to take advantage of the so-called reverse KL divergence. Uh, but right now, let's stick with this definition um, and take this as a measure of the, uh, you know, uh, of the distance between uh, uh, P and Q. Okay. So effectively, uh, with this definition, um, so let me actually define first the cross entropy since I, I mentioned it with words. So the cross entropy between P and Q is this term that is given here. Again, we use Q for our uh, code book. Uh, when our source uh, uh, data uh, is coming from a distribution uh, pi of x. Okay, so uh, you can, uh, um, you know, you can think uh, in multiple ways um, of the KL divergence. So one of the ways is it represents the extra number of bits that you need to encode data uh, when uh, uh, you use uh, the distribution Q for encoding instead of using the actual distribution P. Okay, so uh, if I go back to the uh, previous uh, definition, this is the encoding of the data when you use uh, uh, P of X as your code book. And here you notice we're using uh, Q of X, okay, some approximation. So the extra number of bits uh, to do that is the KL distance. Uh, okay, um, uh, and again, um, you know, 
I ref since I refer here to the extra number of bits interpretation, I say that KL uh, distance is greater or equal to zero, but uh, I promise you using the Jensen's inequality we're actually going to prove more formally in a much nicer way, I hope in one of the forthcoming uh, slides. Okay, so let me uh, uh, go and um, uh, uh, give you some results that you can uh, uh, use in your calculations. Um, I am The algebra is in the slides, so I'm not going to bother to go through the algebra. Uh, if P is a Gaussian with uh, mean mu and uh, variance sigma squared, and Q is another Gaussian with mean M and variance S squared, you can actually compute analytically uh, the KL distance, and uh, that's something you should um, uh, use directly uh, if you have to do computations. But obviously, um, it is uh, not common to approximate one Gaussian um, uh, with another, right? Uh, uh, I cannot see uh, out of uh, nowhere at this point how this can be useful, but somehow if you have two arbitrary Gaussians and um, you know and uh, you wonder how close they are to each other, uh, you can use the KL measure uh, that you see in the bottom. And you can formally expand this to the multivariate case. So if you have the multivariate P of X being this multivariate Gaussian and you have uh, Q of X being by this, uh, with uh, mean mu and covariant cell, you can uh, derive this wonderful formula that is given uh, in the bottom for the KL distance. Again, it's very handy. And the derivation, uh, the only thing it requires, if you expand the KL distance, right, you remember you get one entropy term and one um, uh, cross entropy term, so you only have to evaluate the cross entropy term. And uh, when you do that integral, you get the nice result that you see uh, in the bottom. Okay, um, so let me uh, move on uh, and provide you uh, more details about uh, the uh, Jensen's inequality. I am not going to uh, do all the proofs, but you know, this is such an essential topic. You certainly need to understand uh, what it is, for what type of functions you can use it, and certainly how you can use it for the log function that is concave. Okay, so let me start with um, a nice schematic first, right? So this is a convex function, all right? So uh, if you take, uh, uh, you know, if you take uh, this point here, all right, as an average, so this is an average, this value here is an average of the values of the function at the points A and B. So think of this as the right-hand side of this inequality, all right? where lambda are the weights in averaging the value of f at a and the value of f at b. So the value of f at this point here, all right, I'm sorry, the, the, the average of the values of f at the points a and b computed at this point is obviously uh, uh, greater or equal to the values of f computed at the average of the points a and b, so greater or equal than the value of the function at this point here. Okay, um, in many ways, uh, that's a definition of what we call a convex function, and I have generalized this definition here, uh, you know, including uh, a, a convex combination of the values of the function at multiple points, and uh, with a constraint that these weights lambda are uh, greater or equal to zero, and the sum of the lambdas uh, is equal to one. I am not going to do the proof, it's given uh, in the slides, okay? Uh, so let me, um, you know, I highlighted that for a convex function, this is sort of, to me, uh, an equivalent st uh, statement of the convexity, but if you want to prove this uh, for um, uh, simple functions, okay, uh, what you need to do, and it's given in the slides, uh, you can prove two different things. Um, you can prove that uh, if you have a function that is convex, right? Uh, I'm going to go directly to the statement. You can prove a function is a convex function. The statement that you see in the bottom is uh, true uh, for any lambda between zero and one. Okay. Um, so um, if the function is convex, uh, then the Jensen's inequality is true, and then uh, you can prove the opposite. 
if the Jensen's inequality is true, you can actually prove that the function is convex and the convexity uh, here is, um, uh, is written uh, in terms of uh, a statement that relates uh, the derivatives at, um, at two points A and B um, where, you know, A is to the left of B, okay? So you have to follow the derivation here, but basically uh, when you have uh, a convex function, as you increase X, the first derivative, the slope increases, and this is what you prove that implies basically convexity. Uh, again, the derivation is not something uh, we can spend time in uh, this course. Uh, the, uh, the proof, uh, the equivalence of the Jensen's inequality with the convexity of a function is given here. Uh, I only prove it basically by taking only two points, so for m equal to 2, if you want to prove it for any arbitrary number of points, obviously you're going to have to use uh, induction. And uh, if any of you wants to do it, you know, that would be sort of a nice uh, homework exercise uh, to assume that this inequality is valid for m points and then to prove it that it's also valid for m plus 1 points. But bottom line, I want you to remember this equation that for any convex function, f at the convex combination of the excise is less or equal to the equivalent convex, convex combination of the f of excise. Okay? Uh, all right. Now, uh, let me put it uh, in uh, uh, sort of uh, some uh, probabilistic form, this, um, uh, this Jensen's inequality. So, uh, if you think uh, of xi being uh, the value of some discrete random variable, and you take lambda i to be the uh, probability that that random variable will take the value xi, so you can actually see that this summation here is nothing but the expectation of x. Okay, And on the right hand side, you can see that this is nothing but the expectation of f of x. So in principle, for a discrete um, uh, random variable uh, x, and for any convex function f, uh, f of the expectation of x is less or equal to the expectation of f of x. Uh, so in many books, um, this will be stated uh, uh, as the primitive form of the Jensen's inequality, but I think uh, what we presented earlier, like what you see on the top, it's a nicer way to remember because geometrically you can immediately write this relation and then this leads uh, to what you see here. Of course, uh, you can move this now that you wrote it like that, you can move it to continuous random variables and, uh, you know, um, I'm only writing the expectations as integrals to remind you that this is for continuous random variables. Uh, so you see uh, the Jensen's inequality uh, for this particular case. Okay, uh, so let me just uh, finish uh, um, with uh, the uh, Jensen's inequality and tell you that it's often applied and we used it before uh, for the uh, log function. So for f being the log function. Now, uh, in our derivation, uh, f has to be a convex function. Uh, the log is concave. So what you need to do is you need to actually reverse the signs of the Jensen inequality when you apply for the uh, log function. And I'm going to give you um, the uh, final equation for that. Uh, effectively, uh, the expectation of the log of x all right, is less or equal than the log of the expectation of x. So it's like using this equation where f is log, but I'm reversing the signs because effectively I am applying uh, Jensen's inequality not for the log function, but for the minus log function. All right, so that's what I have here. The minus log function is convex. So when I get rid of the signs and I reverse the order of the inequality, I get this wonderful formula in the bottom that actually you will see it written and being used quietly uh, all the time. Okay, so this is a very fundamental inequality uh, in, um, uh, in probability. Uh, okay, um, I have, uh, you know, you can do a lot of other fancy things with uh, the Jensen inequality, and I have sort of a trivial uh, homework exercise that I don't want uh, uh, to go through it, uh, but I recommend that you guys uh, uh, take uh, uh, 10 minutes to look at it. 
And uh, so using the Jensen's inequality in this slide, it proves that the geometric uh, mean of the uh, some values of uh, x1 to xm is less or equal than the algebraic mean. Okay, and effectively, uh, I have used the Jensen inequality uh, for the uniform random variable to do that proof. Okay, you should be able to follow the slide uh, without uh, me having to spend uh, uh, any time to discuss uh, further uh, what you see here. Okay, uh, so uh, let's uh, uh, keep moving. There's still lots of new concepts that uh, we need to uh, introduce. All right. Um, so um, I used before the uh, you know the Jensen's inequality for the uh, KL divergence. So let me just uh, uh, repeat the same argument. Uh, so you remember the KL uh, divergence between uh, the distributions P and Q is given by this nice formula. So what I have here actually I have directly the minus log, which is uh, a convex function. So I can write this directly as minus, I can move the log out. So this is greater or equal minus the log of p times q over p, p and p cancel out, integral of q, q is normalized is equal to 1, log of 1 is equal to 0, and immediately you get that the KL distance is uh, uh, greater or equal uh, to 0, and this is what uh, we use, uh, uh, this is what we used before. Um, so uh, again, uh, when you use the KL distance, remember it's not symmetric. It's uh, it's always greater or equal to zero, and um, uh, you can show that it's only uh, equal to zero uh, when the distribution uh, P is equal to the distribution uh, Q. All right. Um, I think uh, since we uh, we discuss about the uh, KL divergence, okay, uh, let me uh, uh, let me try to give sort of an alternative uh, proof of something uh, that I stated earlier for the discrete distribution. Do you remember that I had mentioned that if you take um, a set of discrete uh, random variables that have the same number of states? and I indicate here the number of states uh, with this uh, calligraphic number here. So this can be five states or 50 states, right? So this calligraphic is the number of states. I think I used the symbol M uh, before in the earlier slides. So you remember I mentioned that um, uh, the, um, you know, the entropy of the uniform distribution is uh, log of the number of states, okay? And we stated that um, the entropy of any other discrete uh, random variable with the same number of states is, uh, has an entropy that is less or equal to the entropy of the uh, uh, uniform uh, random variable. So actually, let me just prove this to get a, a, a sense of how strong this, um, this KL and how useful this KL distance is. So let's take any discrete random variable with some distribution p of x and let's compute its distance from the uniform uh, random variable with the same number of states okay um, so uh, if you use the definition of the kl distance okay uh, you get here minus the entropy of uh, uh, of p all right this is what i indicate here and then the first term is minus p uh, times uh, log of, uh, of uh, u, all right? Um, so um, remember the density of the uniform uh, random variable is one over the number of states. So this can come out of the summation and the sum of p of x for all x will give you one. So what you get is you get log of the number of states minus h of x. And because that's a KL distance, this has to be greater or equal to zero. So immediately you can see that the uniform uh, random variable with uh, a given number of um, states has the maximum entropy uh, than any other discrete distribution with the same number of states. Okay, so again, uh, this is uh, the result uh, that the fact that the KL distance uh, between two distributions is a number that is greater or equal to zero. By the way, this uh, result that you see here in um, 
statistics is also called the principle of uh, insufficient reason that argues in favor of using uniform distributions when there is no other reason to favor uh, uh, one distribution over another. So this uh, uh, goes with this philosophy of using a maximum uh, entropy distribution, right? Uh, if uh, uh, you have no particular reason to use an informative uh, prior, you have no knowledge uh, that will lead you to one prior versus another, uh, using the uniform distribution, which has a maximum net uh, entropy, uh, it's basically going under what is called uh, the principle of uh, insufficient uh, reason. All right, let me um, uh, keep going a little bit with the KL divergence and give you uh, uh, another property that you will actually uh, see uh, down um, in, um, as, uh, as a statement for uh, maximum likelihood estimation of distributions. Okay, let me explain what uh, exactly I, want, I mean here. All right, so uh, suppose we have some data that are sampled from some distribution P of X, right? And we are trying to approximate this distribution with some tractable distribution Q of X that has some parameters theta. So think, you know, that um, uh, this distribution Q is a Gaussian and theta is um, the, uh, you know, is um, uh, the mean and the variance, okay? So usually, uh, we're, since we're going to approximate uh, uh, P of X with uh, Q of X given theta, uh, given our samples, uh, effectively what we can do is we can compute the parameters theta by maximizing uh, the likelihood that uh, the distribution Q uh, uh, interprets this particular data set X1 to X capital N. All right, that's the maximum likelihood uh, estimator for theta using this distribution uh, uh, Q of X. Now, let me uh, use the KL distance between P and Q, all right? So I'm gonna use the KL distance between P and Q. And you notice here, uh, this integral is sort of the expectation of the log of Q over P under the distribution P. So I can actually use uh, a Monte Carlo approximation as we have seen in our earlier lecture and I can approximate this integral, this expectation, as, um, uh, you know, using samples as one over the number of samples, summation of uh, minus log of Q at uh, Xn uh, plus log of uh, P of Xn, all right? So I'm approximating, again, the expectation of the log of Q over P under the distribution P using samples. So remember that um, uh, if you are trying to find a distribution Q that um, approximates the distribution P given the fact that we have the samples, the obvious thing to do is to minimize this distance uh, between P and Q, the KL distance. And the minimization of this distance, if you look at the right hand side, the only place where parameters of the distribution Q come is the first term. And there is a minus sign here. So effectively, minimizing the distance between P and Q to compute the parameters theta is the same as maximizing the likelihood of the data Xn under the distribution Q. So effectively, uh, now we can see a way to write maximum likelihood estimation uh, as a KL minimization problem. And uh, uh, a lot of times in uh, research papers, you will see uh, people writing, uh, you know, maximum likelihood statements using KL distances, uh, and other times writing KL distances uh, using maximum likelihood estimates. So in one case, we minimize this distance. In the other case, uh, we maximize uh, the log likelihood, right? Because there is uh, a minus here uh, in front of this. Okay. Uh, don't really want to say much more, but now you can see that there is a direct connection between uh, the KL distance and uh, the uh, maximum uh, likelihood estimator. And um, uh, and by the way, before I, I mentioned that I, I use a Monte Carlo, um, uh, you know, uh, estimate of that expectation of uh, log of Q over P, 
But another way to actually look at this so we can uh, make connections with other concepts that you learned in the course up to now, another way will be, since we only know P in terms of samples, will be to actually substitute this P here with the empirical distribution. And uh, you can actually immediately see that maximizing the likelihood of the data under the distribution Q is the same as minimizing the distance of Q from the empirical distribution of P. I mean, both what I have here and the previous slide are the same things, right? Before I approximated that expectation with samples and really that uh, it was not any different from actually using an approximation of the distribution P using uh, the empirical distribution that I have introduced uh, in earlier lectures, okay? So uh, maximum likelihood estimation and minimizing the distance of uh, the empirical distribution from the approximating distribution uh, turned out to be uh, equivalent concepts. So it may help you in understanding papers to actually uh, uh, be sure that uh, you understand uh, the equivalence of these two statements. Okay, um, let me uh, keep moving and I'm going to introduce now what is called a conditional entropy. So a conditional entropy uh, is given by the formula that you see on the left hand side here. So you notice the uh, uh, probability uh, that I use for my code book here is a conditional probability of y given x, okay? And uh, uh, the average is done with the joint distribution of y and x. I emphasize in the definition here. Uh, so the data that they're coming are data in x and y that follow this distribution, the joint distribution of x and y. And if you want uh, an equivalent definition of this, you can actually uh, see this uh, conditional entropy as the average under the distribution p of x of this conditional entropy where uh, the random variable x has been fixed to a little x. Maybe this can make um, a little bit more sense. And of course, uh, you may ask me what is um, uh, this conditional density? You use exactly the definition of the entropy, all right, where uh, your uh, data coming are coming from the distribution P of Y given little x. And the code book also uh, involves the probability of Y given your little x, okay? So if you take this conditional entropy and you average it over all x's coming from p of x, you get this conditional entropy. How do you go from this to that? The only thing you have to do is you write this joint as uh, p of x times p of uh, x p of y given x, right? And um, um, and uh, then immediately you will see that the formula to the right uh, is coming in front of you. So uh, the idea here is uh, this distribution represents uh, the average information to specify the random variable y if we already know the value of x, okay? So this is for particular value of x, this conditional entropy here, and if we average of this, uh, then we get uh, this conditional of capital Y uh, given uh, capital X. So if um, um, I put, uh, if I use uh, this uh, product rule for the joint distribution, okay, I can uh, write uh, the, um, the joint entropy of X and Y, all right? I can write the joint entropy of uh, uh, X and Y as the conditional entropy plus uh, H of X. So what you need to do is uh, go here on the definition and uh, when you have the conditional, uh, write this as the ratio of the joint PDF divided by P of X, and then immediately you will actually come up with this uh, nice formula. And um, uh, so um, here again, this is the entropy of the two variables X and Y together, and uh, H of X is uh, the differential entropy uh, uh, of X. Now, um, you may be confused now, what exactly is the conditional uh, entropy uh, of H um, uh, of Y given X, right? And um, so let me uh, do one example for discrete variables and I'm going to highlight it, okay? Uh, so I'm gonna take the 
conditional entropy, exactly as we defined it in the earlier slide, but now for a discrete uh, random variables uh, x uh, and y. And I'm going to ask myself, what if this conditional entropy is zero, what does it mean? Okay, so I'm going to set this equal to zero, all right? And I'm gonna ask, what exactly does it mean? And um, so, um, can you see how I, I'm getting this uh, uh, definition here? You remember here I have the joint, so I can write the joint as the condition of y given x times p of x, okay? And I put the minus sign uh, inside. So immediately here you can see an entropy term for y given x. So this is greater or equal to zero for discrete random variables, okay? So I have something that is positive, multiply with uh, a probability that is positive, and the answer has to be equal to zero. And you say, when uh, actually this, uh, I have summation, of course, for all possible values of x, j, and, and y, j, all right, this is the double summation, but you can ask if this is a positive number multiplied with probabilities, when this can be equal to zero. And uh, the only way that this can be uh, equal to zero will be uh, the following. Let's take a location where uh, this uh, probability xj is not zero, all right? Uh, so then effectively, if this is not zero, this uh, parenthesis has to be equal to zero, all right? So this conditional times the log of this conditional has to be zero. So uh, remember here, right, uh, that this conditional is a normalized distribution, all right? So, um, if it is, you know, this formula tells you either this is zero, all right, or it tells you the log is equal to zero. So, either the probability of some terms here are zero, or the probabilities here are equal to one, all right? Uh, and don't forget that I have a summation over all i's and j's, but if I take a location and I look at a particular location where uh, uh, xj is uh, not equal to zero, the only way for that to happen is if there is only one yi where this conditional is equal to one with all the other conditional uh, uh, values of uh, p of yi given xj being exactly equal to zero. And if you look at this equation, p of y given xj equal to one means that the relation between x and y xj and yi is deterministic, which means, um, you know, that if I know x, I know exactly what y is. y is a function of x. So here is the intuition, and maybe this whole derivation and all of this noise uh, going fast presenting the slide don't mean anything, but uh, what you can get out of this is if this uh, conditional entropy is equal to zero, uh, effectively that implies uh, that y is a function of x for a discrete random variable, okay? So effectively, uh, knowing x, all right, uh, makes y a deterministic entity, fully defined, and if it's a deterministic entity, it has zero entropy, okay? That's what the meaning is uh, of this um, uh, conditional um, uh, entropy. Okay, um, so let me... Uh, uh, move and, and define what's called a mutual information, okay? So, um, I had mentioned in the past, right, that, um, you know, one measure of independence is, and from the definition of between, of densities, is if the joint density of x and y is equal to p of x times p of y, uh, that's a good measure of independence. So now I can formally write this uh, in terms of the KL divergence, between uh, p of x comma y and, and the product p of x and p of y. So, you know, how independent uh, these random variables x and y are uh, is this KL distance, and I call this the mutual information. So that's my mutual information uh, between x and y. It's a number greater or equal to zero. And you remember from uh, the properties of the KL divergence, um, uh, the, uh, this information, this mutual information is zero when uh, p of x comma y is equal to p of x 
uh, times p of y, which means if x and y are independent, and similarly if x and y are independent, uh, the uh, mutual information is equal to zero. All right. So this is a very nice measure uh, of uh, independence uh, for two random variables using the KL distance between them, and we call that uh, the mutual information between uh, x and y. Okay, um, I can do a little bit of algebra, and uh, so using uh, the definition of the mutual information, I can uh, take this p of x and put it in the denominator, and uh, I can uh, combine with a joint PDF and put the conditional here of p of y given x, and actually you can immediately see the conditional uh, entropy coming uh, from these two terms, and uh, effectively, uh, uh, x would be integrated out when I multiplied it with log of p of y. So the mutual information turns out to be the entropy of y minus the entropy of y given x. And actually, you know, easily you can put some interpretation here, right? I mean, I'm looking at here and it says uh, the mutual information is the entropy of y, all right? So it is the degree of... Um, information I get when I receive y minus the information I receive uh, y when I know what x is. Okay? Now, you can immediately see uh, if, um, uh, you know, knowing x provides zero information about y, this whole calculation is going to give you zero, but formally now you can see that I can define it in terms of the entropy of y minus the conditional entropy of, uh, y given, um, uh, of y given x, okay? And I have written uh, this formula in the bottom, uh, writing this both using the entropy of x and this conditional density and the entropy of uh, y and um, uh, that conditional uh, entropy. I can give you those things schematically as well. Uh, this is, I believe, uh, a schematic uh, from uh, uh, Bishop's uh, book, okay? So you can actually uh, see the uh, mutual information uh, being um, uh, h of x, right? That you see with this circle minus uh, the conditional of, uh, entropy of x given y, and the same way uh, when uh, I use y uh, instead of x. And, be and uh, because this um, uh, mutual information is a KL distance, right, it's greater or equal to zero, you can actually show immediately that uh, uh, the entropy of X is greater or equal than the conditional entropy of X given Y, right? And if you think about it, uh, the anticipation here, if somehow you know Y, uh, you uh, expect... Uh, if y brings some information, the entropy for x will go down, okay? And um, so that's sort of a, uh, a common sense uh, statement. And let me just uh, give you a Bayesian perspective, which I think is sort of uh, very nice here. So think of uh, uh, x uh, being, uh, p of x being your prior distribution, right? And um, uh, x given y being your posterior distribution. So think of y being some data, and you're looking at the posterior distribution of x given some data y, all right? So you uh, expect the information about your unknowns x, all right? Uh, the uncertainty about those unknowns to go down uh, if you provide data, and that's exactly what is the paradigm that uh, the, um, you know, uh, the posterior uh, will reduce the uncertainty that is contained uh, in the prior model, okay? So again, uh, you can think of this analog. If x follows some prior distribution and x given y is uh, uh, your posterior uh, distribution where y is, uh, is your data. Okay. Um, so we have been a uh, long way and, and um, um, I have uh, a few more uh, inequalities that are rather easy to, uh, to prove. So I have a statement here that the joint entropy of X and Y, it's less than the entropy of X plus the entropy of the Y. I'm actually not going to do this derivation uh, if you use uh, the mutual information definition uh, and uh, the definition of this um, 
uh, conditional entropy and you combine the two things, uh, the answer is in front of you. So you can actually read uh, the slide here and, um, um, you know, and actually you can uh, show that the equality here is valid only if the uh, random variables x and y are uh, independent. Okay, so treat this uh, sort of uh, as a homework uh, exercise and uh, playing with the definitions of uh, mutual information, conditional information, and, and, uh, and the like. Okay, um, so um, uh, I have uh, one example uh, for uh, two random variables that they are correlated. So you can see here, they are following uh, a Gaussian distribution. And uh, I remind you, if you look at the covariance metrics, rho is what I call uh, earlier in another lecture, the correlation coefficient. You remember uh, the correlation coefficient was the covariance uh, between x and y divided uh, by uh, the vari uh, you know, by basically the standard deviation of x times the standard deviation of y. So in this case, the two standard deviations are the same. Uh, so if I divide this element by sigma square, rho is the correlation coefficient. So if you, I'm not going to do the algebra, it's a, uh, a worth uh, uh, homework to do, uh, it introduces a value, and you don't have to do any algebra, you can use the formulas for the entropy of a Gaussian. So if you use the entropies for x and y, um, I mean x and y, the marginals basically follow a Gaussian distribution of their own, all right? And uh, if you also compute the entropy of the joint distribution of x and y, and, uh, uh, and you go and you compute the mutual information, uh, comes to be given by this nice formula that you see there. And I want you to you remember the mutual information, uh, uh, you know, we uh, put a meaning to it, right? Uh, 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 as an indicator uh, of independence between random variables. So let's check it out for uh, this example. If the correlation coefficient is zero, all right, and in this case, you can see the two random variables will be independent. If rho is equal to zero, you get log of one here. So the uh, mutual information comes to be equal to zero. And if the relation uh, between x and y is linear with uh, plus minus uh, slope, uh, you can immediately see that when rho is equal to one, this blows up and the mutual information uh, goes to infinity. So in this case, uh, the mutual information is um, uh, a measure of um, the dependence, the linearity basically between x and y, but uh, uh, obviously the way that uh, I want to advertise the use of the mutual information that is uh, extremely important, uh, not only for linear relations, but also for nonlinear relations uh, between uh, x and y. All right, so I'm going to finish with um, a new concept that has been around for uh, a few years and it's receiving a lot of attention. And this is what is called a point-wise mutual information. Okay, so this is similar to um, uh, the uh, mutual information that we defined before, but let's start uh, rather than uh, talking about the mutual information, which you remember it was uh, the KL distance between the joint and the product of the marginals. Let me start with that minus log term that comes in the mutual information definition that we used before. Okay, so I'm going to use this and I'm going to call it as a point-wise mutual information, PMI, but I'm going to use it uh, for events, uh, not random variables. Okay, uh, so you can think uh, of this being used when x and y take particular values, right? Those are uh, my events, and I'm going to call this uh, the point-wise mutual uh, information. Uh, and obviously, um, you know, if you uh, average this uh, with respect to the uh, uh, joint distribution, then you get what we had seen uh, before for the uh, mutual information, but right now I'm only uh, I'm only going to use uh, this uh, PMI, uh, if you like, uh, uh, point-wise. Okay, um, so in uh, some sense, uh, similar to what we have seen for mutual information, uh, this uh, point-wise mutual information brings us 
the amount that we learn when we update uh, from a, a prior uh, to a posterior, right? This is what I discussed before, right? So that's uh, a measure of the uh, information gained uh, when uh, we uh, go from a prior uh, to the uh, posterior. All right, so the question is, you know, if this point-wise mutual information is used uh, uh, for uh, events and we want to use it um, uh, for continuous random variables, uh, the only way we can do this is if we discretize continuous random variables, and that will require uh, to binarize, right, to split the domains of X and Y in bins, all right, and somehow uh, extend this definition of PMI uh, over all possible values x and y uh, that can vary uh, in the different locations in the different bins of my uh, discretization. All right, so let me, uh, by the way, this uh, binarization of uh, continuous random variables, of course, is something that we use to do uh, uh, density estimation. So you can actually compute the mutual information that I will discuss uh, at the same time as computing uh, the density of many random variables, but you don't have to do the two things together. You can actually separate them and use different algorithms. So let me uh, uh, assume the following, okay, just to simplify the notation. So we have two random variables, x and y. So what I'm going to do is I am going to describe some discretization of the domain of x and y. Uh, that I'm going to denote with this calligraphic letter G, okay? So this is a grid that has size um, uh, X and size Y in uh, each random variable, all right? So I'm uh, binarizing basically my X and Y variables uh, using um, uh, uh, this grid, okay? And uh, so the size of the grid is uh, X times Y, all right? X times Y. So maybe you split the X direction in... Uh, three bins, the y direction five, so x times y uh, is uh, 15. And I'm looking at its uh, point-wise mutual information, and I'm going to try to compute this maximum of this discrete um, point-wise uh, mutual information uh, measures that I introduced before, and I'm going to normalize them by the log of the mean between x and uh, y. Okay, so this is uh, sort of a, a normalization. So for a given uh, grid, you define this m of x comma y. Um, okay, uh, so it looks like some um, um, you know information coefficient. Okay, uh, and it is for a given grid. And of course, uh, you know when uh, you discretize two uh, random variables x and y, you can have many different discretizations. So actually, we're going to play with all possible discretizations uh, that have um, a number of bins less than a certain size. And from all of these measures M, we're going to compute the maximum. And this is what's called the maximal information coefficient. Okay? Um, in uh, some sense, this uh, capital B that you see there is related uh, also to the number of samples uh, that you use when you compute, uh, when you do density estimation, and uh, when you check the references that are listed in the slides, they give you a measure uh, that relates the two quantities. But for us right now, again, uh, we binarize uh, the variability of X and Y, right, with some grid. Uh, we can have multiple grids uh, up to some uh, given product of uh, X times Y. And uh, we compute this coefficient sum, and the maximum of these coefficients is what's called the maximal information coefficient. And this is uh, what uh, is advocated in very recent papers, including this recent paper published in Science, as uh, being um, uh, the right way to compute uh, associations between many random variables in high dimensions. Okay, so this is the maximal uh, information coefficient, okay? So um, let me uh, go directly and uh, uh, give you uh, some example. Here we have um, uh, a data set that uh, indicates, 
you know, social, economic, and other indicators from uh, the World, uh, World Health Organization. Uh, this is in, uh, published in the original science paper that uh, is listed uh, uh, here. And uh, the plot on the left shows me the correlation coefficient versus um, uh, this maximum information coefficient. This is MIC uh, score. And uh, these are all the data sets that you see. And uh, if I remember, there was um, uh, more than 60,000 uh, uh, pairs that are listed on this uh, diagram on the plot. And then uh, the paper provided a lot uh, of um, plots of how individual variables vary with um, uh, uh, other variables in uh, this data set of 357 variables. So let's examine uh, a few relations between these variables uh, uh, by referring to this plot of the correlation coefficient and uh, the maximum information uh, uh, coefficient score in the horizontal axis. All right, so what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to take first, uh, uh, let's take this point C here, all right? So this point C, you notice this area here has both a low uh, correlation coefficient and uh, a, a low MIC uh, score, all right? Um, and if you actually see how uh, those data points, if you plot different variables together, you can see actually uh, that there is no really relation between those um, uh, those two variables, okay? So you can see the data are all over the place. There is no really identifiable relation corresponding to this domain, uh, uh, this domain C. Now, let me take these points D and H that both have uh, both a high uh, mix score, but also a high uh, correlation uh, coefficient. So just from the correlation coefficient, you will expect uh, these data points to be highly related at least linearly and this is exactly what we see for let's say if we look at the uh, data set uh, and we look at two variables for the uh, this point uh, uh, d uh, you can see uh, the relation is linear and in some way for uh, h uh, the relation uh, is linear as well but then if you go to another extreme and you take let's say these uh, uh, points uh, FGE, uh, these points have very small correlation uh, coefficients. So you may say, well, you know what, uh, there is no correlation there, all right, uh, very small uh, correlation, but they have uh, a very high uh, uh, mix score. So when you plot uh, variables uh, and you look at the densities and how these points vary, let's say, for uh, uh, F for uh, G, you notice uh, these uh, variables are highly correlated, but their relation is nonlinear. So this um, uh, maximal information coefficient is capable of capturing uh, nonlinear dependencies between uh, variables and data in the way that the correlation coefficient uh, is not capable uh, uh, in doing. Uh, again, the correlation coefficient, it is a measure of linear correlations. Uh, what you hear now, uh, this maximum information coefficient, is something that you can use for any sort of relations, right? It can be linear relations, but it can be also uh, highly uh, nonlinear relations. All right, so uh, lots of concepts today for, uh, in, from information theory. Uh, we introduce uh, entropy, we introduce mutual information, uh, we introduce uh, 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 KL distances and uh, Jensen's inequality uh, and of course we finish up uh, with uh, this new innovation on uh, computing dependencies between random variables and data that goes under the name of uh, maximum information coefficient uh, so I know there is a lot of information out there but keep in mind uh, all of these things uh, can be useful certainly the ideas of KL divergence uh, the mutual information and Jensen's inequality are things that I will be using uh, very often uh, in uh, follow-up lectures in this course and certainly in the more advanced uh, machine uh, learning courses to be offered next semester. All right, so I'm going to stop there and uh, I will see you next Tuesday. Bye.